my my legal formal name is Aurora Isabella Luna McCaig. <laughs> um, but I go by Aurora um, and typically Aurora Mac. Aurora means a lot to me being um, that Sleeping Beauty is my favorite Disney movie and I felt like I slept through a lot of my life. Um, but also I, I, I spin fire and I spin LEDs. So I create my own Aurora Borealis that friends joke about. Um, so my, my name has a little meaning to me um, and that's why I chose it. From, from birth, I, I knew or I felt that I should have been born a cis woman. I mostly grew up in, in the 90s um, in a rural town where being different was, was not necessarily accepted. I had a lot of experiences as a child that gave me the impression that I wasn't right or that I was broken or I was wrong. I was a very feminine presenting child. Um, I'd pink everything, my parents are fantastic, I had a Barbie car, I had a doll that would carry me everywhere. I distinctly remember being a child, um, I think I was three or four at the time and at a street barbecue um, and coming around the corner to, to see my dad to get a drink. One of the older men in the street was, it was a farmer that had horses and had some cattle. I was talking to my dad and I was like, oh, I want a drink. I'm coming around the corner and I look at my dad and he's talking to this older man. And, and he says to my dad, like, oh, Luke, what the, what the bloody hell are you doing with your son? Like, what are, you, what, are you, what are you letting him walk around like this for? And I remember my dad saying, like, it's just a kid. Like, kids do what kids do. Like, it's not a big deal. It's the first memory that I, I remember thinking that I was different or I was wrong or I, broken or that like, I, I felt for a lot of my life that I had a sickness that I, I should try and fight and I should try and beat. Not long after that, my parents got rid of all of my pink things and we had cherry blossoms at the front and it was at the same time the cherry blossoms kind of dropped, um, which is, is very dramatic. Um, but it was like my, the, the pink things fell off the trees and my family got rid of the pink things in my home. It was enormously impactful and it impacted the rest of my life, right? Like the, the next like 27 plus years, I spent fighting that moment. Um, yeah. I didn't realise how much effort I actively put into not being myself until I stopped putting effort into not being myself. Um, but I, I spent the majority of my life fighting this thing that I thought was a sickness. Um, in that, no, I didn't. I didn't want to be a trans person. I didn't. I didn't want to have to. I knew it would be difficult. I knew it would be hard. Um, every experience that I had um, with with people. That, that might have um, had some sort of intonation of, of anything being transgender, or even, even cross-dressing, that people reacted negatively towards that, or that, that men that wanted to be women, or men that wanted to dress in women's clothing, or these feelings that I had that were so intrinsically me, that were so core to who I was a person, were, were treated with such disdain or such disgust. 2016 was sort of the year that, that kind of broke me, but in a good way. Um, my my mum had, had battled cancer on and off for um, 11 years, um, which is still, still a hard thing. Um, she's, she's my hero and always will be. I felt like I was putting so much energy into to not being myself and to actively putting on this mask and overcompensating to, to be masculine. Like I, was, I had a beard, um, I was a competitive power lifter. Um, I was eating and lifting my feelings instead of talking about them. And people around me started to notice that I wasn't doing very well um, and like my relationship was failing with, with this, this poor young woman. Um, and then 2016 kind of came along and in, in that year, within a six month period, my, my mum passed. Um, I, I was made redundant from my job. Um, I, I'd, I'd worked for one of the major banks in Australia for 13 years. Um, the only company I'd ever worked for out of school and, and I was made redundant. Um, I was in diagnosed with Parkinson's disease not long after that. Um, and then again, not long after that, my, my partner left me. Um, and, and no, absolutely no, no, nothing against her. Um, it would have been extraordinarily difficult to, to survive a relationship under that much trauma as, as two young people and me not dealing with my shit, basically. I'm not dealing with my stuff. Um, and not going to therapy and basically bottling everything inside and becoming a husk of a person. But like silver lining wise, 2016 was also probably the best year of my life and it actually forced me to, it was a real make or break kind of moment, like really sink or swim as far as like, you need to get out and live your life or don't live at all. Like, and I'm not being dramatic about that and that I, I thought quite a lot about committing suicide, um, about self harm, about, about ending my life. Cause I thought at that point I lost everything. I lost my partner. I lost my mum, my hero, um, I lost my job, um, 
and I've been diagnosed with an incurable illness, which, which will eventually kill me. And at that point in time, like I'm one of the youngest people that's ever been diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's disease in the, in the history of Australian medicine um, at 29. But they couldn't give me uh, even a rough idea of, of a prognosis. I, I could have been severely disabled or dead within three to five years, or I could live to 80, but I just didn't know. It made me wake up. Um, like it kicked my ass in, in a horrific way. Like I was, I was terrified. All I could think about for the longest time was when am I gonna die? And I felt like I'd lost a lot of, of my identity um, in that I was using work and a relationship and a career as, as things to hide my, my pain and my trauma and, or to not have to deal with things. That stress of working was taken away from me or the stress of thinking about being a transgender person in, in the corporate environment. Um, my, my partner left, which also took another stress away from me of not having to be a thing for a person. that I, that Not that it, she ever pressured me to, to be something for her, but I felt that I needed to be the, the man in the relationship or to be masculine or to be the breadwinner, all that kind of stuff that society kind of presses you into feeling. Um, that was taken away. So I, I, I didn't want for anything financially. I didn't have to be anything for anyone else. Um, and it was a real stark moment for me of like, either live your life or give up. Um, and I couldn't give up, right? Like, I'm not, I wanted to at my points. Like, I actually wanted to. Um, I felt like a coward that I'd lived, I'd lived 30 years untruthfully. Um, I, I lied to myself. I felt like I'd lied to other people. Um, but it was, it was such a wake up call of watching my mum fight this disease as well for 11 years that, and thinking like, I haven't even tried to fight. I haven't even tried. I would not be where I am now if I wasn't forced. I'd probably still be depressed. I'd probably still be overweight. I'd probably still have a beard <laughs> um, <laughs> if I wasn't forced, right? And like, I know now that those feelings of disgust and, and, and cowardice that I had towards myself were such toxic things to put on myself and such horrible pressure, pressure is to put on myself. But in that moment, I felt disgusted. It was the 29th of November, 2016. It was my grandmother's 80th birthday. And my dad and my dad and me went to Queensland for her birthday. And while I was away for that weekend, my, my partner was moving out. Um, and I got home to a half empty home and, and I thought about killing myself. I thought about ending my life at that point in time because I, I felt like I lost everything and that I was a, a, a terrible person. I'd, I'd done nothing. I hadn't accomplished anything. I, I hadn't done anything that I should have done. I hadn't been true to myself. And I, I wanted to do it, but I couldn't because I just kept thinking back to my mum who'd fought so hard for so long. Like, I felt like it would be rude. It'd be, it would dishonor her memory. That I, I had watched this woman fight for so long, so hard that like, but I'd also seen the impact of her passing, what that had had on my family, on everyone around her. Um, I couldn't do that to people. I couldn't, I couldn't do that to my mum. I couldn't do that to my dad, um, to my friends. So it was, or well, myself, right? Like, but I was, I don't know, I feel like I've lived a lot of my life putting other people before me and not putting myself first. And it was at that moment that I realised that I had to do something about this. Like, I, I couldn't live a moment longer without trying. Like, I did have internalised transphobia directly targeted at myself. Like, I was always fine with anyone else being being any sort of variety of anything. I, I, I no judgment of anyone at all, but for me, it wasn't okay. Which again, it, like it's such a toxic thing to, to put on yourself. Um, and I was quite lucky that my Parkinson's specialist, um, Dr. Will, um, he's so lovely, but he, as part of being diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, so my, with Parkinson's disease, your brain doesn't make dopamine, which is one of the feel good chemicals of regulating mood, um, and an everyday kind of well-being and he said like he'd known that my mum had passed he didn't know exactly what else i had going on um he said to me as part of our treatment plan you need to see a psychologist and honestly that was that's something that saved my life um that i'll always be thankful for um seeing a psychologist has been the best money i've ever spent um priceless i started to see um dr ling and we, we, would talk, we talk, started to talk through everything. Um, my, my relationship breakdown, um, my Parkinson's disease, my mum passing, um, my life. And I, I just, I vividly remember this moment where she said to me, and at that point my, my name was Sean, um, and I was still presenting mail, and she said to me, Sean, I, even though we've talked about a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, so much stuff, um, I feel like there's something else. 
that, that might even be bigger than the rest of the stuff. And I was like, oh no, I've been seen. And she said to me, um, I, do you want to talk about it? And I said, I'm, I'm not ready, but I do. Like I want. When it got to the point where I was, I was going to do it, um, I, I often would throw myself under the bus and like dob myself in. I'm like, I'm going to do it. And I remember waiting for this appointment and I think I went to the bathroom about six times with nervous weeks before I got in to see her. Um, and I remember saying to her, I got in there and I started crying. And she's like, are you okay? What's wrong? And I'm like, I'm not okay. <laughs> I've never been okay. Like I literally had never been okay my entire life. And I said to her for, for as long as I can remember, I'd always wish that I'd been born a girl. Um, fully expecting her to, to, to be disgusted or to have a negative response. Like I had such a strong feeling that, that would be received negatively. And, and she just gave me a hug. Like it was okay. It wasn't, it wasn't the end of the world. Like it was such a big thing for me to let this thing out of me that I'd, I'd held on to for, for three decades. Um, and it was okay. Like I feel, I feel like if that hadn't have gone okay, that again, I probably would not be where I am now. Um, like it's such a pivotal moment for me to the first person I ever told. I'd not told a single soul about these feelings until that point in my life. From that point, everything that I did towards becoming me felt good. Once I opened the floodgates, it was, it was a flood. It was um, like putting dynamite against the wall of a dam. Once I let a little bit out, it was this unstoppable torrent. It, it still took me, I think, like after then um, coming out to my psychologist, it took me another two or three months to, to tell somebody else. And the first person I told was my sister. Um, we, we weren't necessarily close as children, and not that I was really that horrible to her, but I remember feeling quite jealous that she was born a woman and I wasn't, or was born a girl and I wasn't. It took us until we were both moved out of home and a bit more mature to, to, to get close. I said to her, like, I. I've, I've got some big news. Um, I've, there's something I really need to tell you. And she's like, oh great, like, um, no worries. Like, come and drop in on your way home to see Dad. I kept waiting for like a gap in conversation or like the, the perfect moment, but like there wasn't a perfect moment or I was making excuses in my own head. Um, and I got to a point where I'm like, I've, I've actually got to get going and make dinner with Dad. Um, and she said to me, Is it, wasn't there something you wanted to tell me? Something important? And I was like, oh, there, there was. Um, Maybe, oh, I've got to get going, but maybe, maybe I'll message you later. She's like, oh yeah, yeah, like nonchalantly, just like, no issue, like it's fine. And in my head, I'm like, oh. <laughs> um, I didn't want to do it over text message because I thought um, that I, I wanted to show people that it was like, it was a real thing. And so I remember after dinner, d dad going to bed and me sitting in bed, um, typing out this text message. I think I. I deleted it and rewrote it about 50 times, if not more, um, to think what's the, what's the best way to word this, like what's the perfect way to word this? And I eventually, I think I hit send close to midnight and I knew that she'd be asleep. But even though I knew that she'd be asleep, I just waited up for hours and hours, looking at my phone thinking like, is she gonna get back to me? And I woke up, um, I looked at my phone and there was a message from her and I had that moment of doubt of like, actually do, do I want to open this? Like, is this going to be okay? Am I, am I going to be okay? Um, and I opened it and of course it was okay. Um, my sister had always been like a very vocal advocate for anyone in the LGBTAQ plus um, bracket, any, any sort of rainbow person. And from that point, having that go well, like I really felt like I did build a lot of momentum. Um, and the more people I told from that point, like the, the more momentum I built um, and the easier it became. I've been through a lot of hard things, but, and this is the hardest thing that I, I could even fathom going through after going through it and still going through it, but it's absolutely 100% the most worthwhile. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't have words for how hard this has been, but I also don't have words for how, how amazing this has been, how worthwhile this has been. Every, every single tear, every single breakdown, every single hardship is absolutely worth it. I don't have words for how how amazing that feels to be able to actually be me, to to look in the mirror and see myself. Um, after having three decades of looking in the mirror and being filled with, with self-hatred and self-loathing, um, to be able to look in the mirror, to be able to see photographs of me while modeling and think like, there she is, like, that's me. That's, that's freaking me.
it was such an amazing experience just in in general but also on, in that aspect that like I I, I came in and I met Hannah and Chloe um, I'm, I'm so glad that I was able to see Hannah and Chloe again um, I said I, I think like all, we just clicked instantly um, I remember Hannah saying to me um, <laughs> when she saw my, my application and, and read my story she was like I want to work with her and it really like <laughs> Yeah, it touched, it, it touched my heart. She was like, I want to work with her. And I felt it. Like, it wasn't, it didn't feel like it was the wanky thing at all. It was just like, she she read what I was about and was like, I want, like, I want to be involved in this. Um, I've felt entirely with, with the photo studio that I've been valued because of my, my ability or my, my accomplishments, but also as a person, I was valued or that my story had value or that I, I had value, which is something I... I've, I've lived most of my life thinking that I didn't have any value. To start entering spaces like this and, and have people actually, for me to feel valued and not in a tokenized way, because um, I have felt that before. As, as I, I tick a few boxes on the minority group list, right? Like I'm, I'm transgender, I'm bisexual, and I've got a disability. Like I'm, I'm a corporate, like I'm a corporate gold mine <laughs> for minority ticks. But I haven't felt that at all here. Like I felt valued for me as actually me, as who I actually was outside of gender or sexuality or any of those kind of things it was like I, I felt that people saw value in me if i've got anything to say to anyone at all ever it's do do the thing whatever the thing is like do do the thing don't fight who you are like be yourself and love yourself and it'll work out like as hard as it is it'll work out it's I don't, I don't know how I'm here. I don't know how I've done this. <laughs> like I've lost 65 kilos and now I'm, I'm living my best life. Like I was a fat hairy mess and now I'm a woman and I'm, I look in the mirror and I see myself and that's something that is absolutely priceless. Like I, I can't put a value on looking in the mirror and seeing myself in the mirror. Being proud of me. Do the hard thing, do it. I've been wanting to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm <laughs> just That's okay. Oh my god, <laughs> Because she's a mess. <laughs> is, it, is it going or is it not going? Oh, it is now. Oh, it is now. Yeah. Um, so, I made the snap decision. Um, after lots of deliberation in November last year that I was going to have to do something about this. Okay. Video diary number one. August 4th. About two and a half months on estrogen. In Hawaii. Um, second day here. Getting ready to go out. Um, it's harder than I thought it would be. I only packed girls' clothes, um, <laughs> and thought I could do it, but um, I'm not ready to go full time here. Like summer clothes are a lot harder. It's a lot more revealing. Um, shows some bits that I'm not super comfortable with, but it's it's good. It's learning, pushing the comfort zone. Having people tell you that, that you've inspired them or that you're amazing and that you're wonderful when you when you don't feel like that it's hard, like you feel like a fraud in that I I feel like I did the only thing that I could do. I feel like I struggled to get through for a whole long period, every second of every minute of every hour of every day. I, I know one day I'll, I, I will be happy with, with myself and who I am and one day I'll be a beautiful creature instead of just a creature and I'm going to make it. At this point um, we're sitting at seven months on hormone therapy. Um, it's been a while since we, we did filming um, and I've been living as a woman in society full-time for a little over three months um, and it's been fantastic um, I've never been happier and I can't I can't believe 
how how happy I am but I'm I'm not even there yet like I've still got quite a while to go but I'm already so incredibly happy um, just ticked over eight months on estrogen um, having a great time <laughs> um, it's been some pretty pretty big ticket items since the last last video we did um, probably the first one was Christmas um, and, and the thought of going back home for the first time as I am now um, last time I was potentially thinking about not going home um, getting getting quite stressed out about it um, having to reintroduce myself to to a lot of people because we we spent Christmas with a few other families I got there and everyone was quite good about it especially considering that some people got an exceptional shock that I, I look substantially different to the to the Christmas before if, if that was the last time that a lot of the, those people had seen me it has been hard and it still is hard um, but it's it's been amazing as well and like I'm um, I think I say it every time we do a video but I'm the happiest I've ever been and I continue to get happier and I'm having so much fun <laughs> a ridiculous amount of fun and I'm a ridiculous creature but I love that <laughs> it it's been an extraordinary process to find yourself and, and who you are after like pushing that down and, and hiding it for, for me being able to to be myself but progressively learn who I am has has been amazingly fulfilling and, and a really beautiful experience